to my children, my grandchildren. Continue to remember them. I've got a, I've got a unspoken request I want the Lord to, to answer for me. Uh, anybody on my right hand side have a request this morning? God that still makes the prayers this morning, right?
happened. Circumstances change and situations change. There are three things that I want to want to say right now. When we pray, when we pray, we recognize the existence of an invisible kingdom. And what I'm talking about is the kingdom of God. God comes into play when we begin to pray. The second thing that prayer reveals is that we as Christians have confidence that God is highly significant and that it affects our lives directly. When we pray, things begin to change in our lives. That the visible things which occur in the world, occur in our world, are a death direct result of something that is happening in the realm of invisibility. When we begin to pray, God begins to change things. Angels begin to move on our behalf. Things begin to happen. Third and perhaps the most hotly contested fact by the devil and his forces is that our prayers, that our prayers play a direct and essential part in bringing God's invisible power to bear on our visible life. You know, we talk about faith not being able to see faith, but we can receive the results of faith. And we can see what happens when we portray faith. In other words, God hears and he answers our prayers. So things begin to happen when we when we begin to pray. The Christian life is a battleground. It's a battleground. Paul uses military images because the first century Christians understood them. He, he, he explains to the Ephesian church about this armor bearer, why he's why he's teaching them or why he's writing this letter to them. He's chained to a guard. Can you imagine that? He's, he's chained to a guard while he's writing this letter to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 20 says that he was an ambassador in bonds. He was, he was, he was in prison, Mother Billy. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 tells us, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 1 Timothy 6 and 12 tells us, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. 2 Timothy 2 and 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4 and 7, this is Apostle Paul speaking at the end of his life. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. So let her begin to look, look at this and begin to think about this and begin to study. There are no recorded cases of demon possession in the Old Testament. None. You will find none in the Old Testament where everybody, where anybody had demon possession or was possessed by the devil. But in the New Testament, you will find that it's very abundant. You will find that it's rampant in the New Testament. And that's because the war that's being waged between God and the devil is a spiritual conflict for yours and my soul. Israel had a physical covenant. They had the covenant of circumcision, and we have a spiritual one. We enter into his blessings, but also into his spiritual battles. The warfare, Sister Maria, has moved from heaven to earth when Jesus was born, and we're still fighting warfare today. There's still a war going on today. Now, the Bible calls our enemy very many different things. And I'm talking about Satan. We talked about him a little bit last week as Lucifer, the son of the morning. And what, what he threw a, a, a rebellion in heaven, Brother Larry. Satan, meaning adversary. The devil, meaning accusers. Belial, meaning extremely wicked. Lucifer, meaning angel of light. The dragon, the serpent, Beelzebub. The evil one, the tempter. The god of this world and the prince of the power of the air and the ruler of this world. Now, I, I just want to preface this, and I meant to say this earlier. I'm not giving credit to the devil this morning. Let's let me know, okay? He's a worthy, he's a worthy adversary, but I have Jesus Christ on my side. This is going to be about, this lesson is going to be about, suspense on what he's given us to fight with. He's not left us powerless. He's
a little bit about this. He's got many. Us in 1 Timothy 3 16. He will try, try to devour us in 1 Peter 5 and 8. He will imprison us in Revelation 2.10 or try to. He ensnares us. 2 Timothy 2.26. He will try to take advantage of us in 2 Philippians 2.11. And he even tries to steal the word of God away from us because he knows that's what breaks our power. This is, this, is, this is interesting right here. Satan is not eternal like God. He is a created being, so his power is limited. I, I, I've often said this. Do you know that he can't read your mind? He can't, he can't read your mind. He only knows what's going to affect us or what's going to lure us or attract us because we already saw him. He's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. He's not everywhere at the same time. His forces of evil will do his work for him. So how does the devil accomplish so much evil? throughout the world, through his organized kingdom of darkness, the principalities of power that Paul talked about, the rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. No matter what our circumstances look like, Brother Larry, our battle is not against human beings. It's not against one another. That's what the enemy will try to do. We try to tear us apart by trying to get us to fight among ourselves. He will always try to do that. If he can get us fighting among ourselves, he can bring us down. One of the, one of the things that I read says, that's why the devil loves religious people who attend church. He uses them on the inside and on the outside. He tries to get us fighting among ourselves. The ancient king of Syria told his soldiers, he said, when they went out to fight, he said, fight neither with small or great, save only with the king. And we've got the king on our side this morning. We've got the king of kings on our side this morning. In Paul's day, arresting match was not married to entertainment. It was a fight to the finish. It was a fight to the death. Usually with a loser having his eyes gouged out or death being occurred. And our battle with Satan is a life or death conflict with eternal consequences. There's only two places you're going to spend eternity, and that's heaven or that's hell. And he will do everything that he can to bring us down. But the good news is that we can defeat him because the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. It's the word again that will bring us victory when we face these battles in our life. It's vital for us as a Christian in the day and age we live in to put on the whole armor of God. In that short passage I read there, I believe that it tells us twice to put on the whole armor of God. Put it all on. Every piece of armor is vital for a spiritual soldier for to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Winning a single battle against Satan does not win the war. It's continuing to fight each and every day. Each and every day. And we have to use all of our spiritual armor. That term that you may really stand reveals much to us about early warfare. The soldier still standing at the end of the battle is usually the winner. Christians do not have to lie dying in the dust of this life. It will always be God's will that we're standing as winners. And I'll even go in a little bit further, Brother Billy. I've read in the back of the book, and we win. I said, I've read in the back of the book, and we win. When a person has fought his last battle in life, the Lord will take his pen and helmet of salvation, his scar shield of faith, and one flesh plate of righteousness to replace them with a crown of life for a victorious, faithful soldier. As we go closer to the Lord, one thing we can be assured of, there are always going to be battles that we have to fight. There are always going to be spiritual battles that we have to fight. One writer said that a Christian who has no conflict in his life has retreated from the front lines of service. He's actually gone AWOL. There will always be spiritual battles that we have to face, that we have to fight. We've all heard about being an armor bearer. An armor bearer. I've taught a lesson on being an armor bearer. An armor bearer is exactly doing what we do. We do what the pastor needs us to do. Well, there, whatever he asks, we're willing to do it. We're, we're, we're armor bearers for the kingdom of God. 
Not only is it for him, he would not ask us to do anything that was not going to benefit the kingdom of God, benefit our church. So we're armor bearers when we, when we do what Brother Gio asked us to do. But there's also a need for a spiritual bearer, or a spiritual armor bearer. This, this passage of scripture that I read in Ephesians 6 talks about us being a Christian soldier. The Bible, I read those passages of scripture, talks us about fighting the good fight of faith to endure hardness as a good soldier. So, Brother Pete, there's going to be battles that I face. That's just the truth of it this morning. That's just the way that it's going to be. But according to God's promise, there's not a weapon listed in this passage of scripture that I read that's not available to every one of us. All those weapons are available to every one of us. A military soldier will never remove his uniform because it distinguishes who he is. It'll tell what branch of services he's in. It'll tell what divisions he's in. I've never been in the military. Brother Justin, you've been in the military before, right? You don't want to take your armor off when you're in the battle. It leaves you open for attack. It leaves you an uh, uh, easy target for the enemy. So a, a, a soldier fighting in a battle will never remove their armor. None of it. Because it's there for his protection. It's there for his defense. It's there for the offense, if you will. So he will never remove it because if he does, it could be the difference between life and death. It's very important that we understand that it's the same way spiritually. It's the same way spiritually. As Christians, our armor is our protection. That is why Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil, if you will, or his schemes or his deception. Paul tells us three times in this passage of Scripture, he said, stand, stand, stand. Hold firm your ground and don't retreat, but stand. Even one point, he says, even after you've done all that you've done, to stand. Don't retreat. Don't retreat. Hold your ground. We have to know the weapons that God has given us, know what they mean, and know how to use them, not only to defend ourselves, but to fight with them. To leave off even one piece is to leave some area of our life exposed and leave us open to the wounded or the hurt that Satan can cause us. Some of you may have never fought a physical battle. And I choose not to. Anybody been in a fist fight lately? No, I don't answer that. Maybe you might have been left in a while. I don't know. Don't, I don't like that thought, by the way. I don't want, I don't want a physical confrontation with somebody. <coughs> but there's going to be spiritual battles that we got to fight from day to day. One of the most important things you have to know in this fight is the strength and the weaknesses of your enemy. What you and I put on, now listen to this, and I, I thought this was really good as I read this. What you and I put on determines the victories that we experience. We dress for victory every morning when we awaken to face a new day. Well, I see we got to pray on that armor of God. we got to pray on the armor of God. We've got to have it on each and every day. Military forces before going to war have a battle plan. And before going to war, they study their enemy and they know their strengths and they know their weaknesses and they know where to attack them at. They have a battle plan ready. They know how they're going to fight the enemy. They're going to know how they fight those forces that are coming against them. And it's the same for us this morning. We have to know our enemy and what our weapons are because you can be sure the devil will know how to attack you. As I've already said, he knows because we showed him a lot of times. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Mr. Kim, I know, I know what he does. I know how he tries to get to me. I, I know the very thing a lot of times of how he tries to get to me because he's got to me before with it. So we're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his schemes. The Apostle Paul's first instructions are, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that phrase means 
Be strong comes from a Greek word meaning to continually be strengthened in the Lord. To be renewed over and over and over again. That's why it's so important. And I want you to hear this. I want you to understand this. When we go to church, it's important that we get everything that we can while we're here. Every blessing that God has to give us, give us every victory that we can win when we come in this place. And I'm not going to say that you can't get it outside this place, but it's so important when we're gathered here together as a body of Christ that we get all the strength that we can get to be renewed over and over and over again. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Ephesians 6.14 Stand therefore having your loins go about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verses 14 through 17 list six pieces of armor. Five defensive weapons and one offensive weapon. All for the protection and to fight defense. And I will even go so much as saying as the sword of the spirit that I'll talk about later. It's not only an offensive weapon but it's a defensive weapon. The first piece that he talks about is the belt of truth. The first piece of armor Paul tells us about is to stand having our loins girt about with truth. Now Roman soldiers in those days girded themselves with a belt from which hung strips of leather to protect their lower body as you can see in this picture right here. The belt of truth was named after this leather belt with an apron that hung in front of the Roman soldier's groin in Lower Avenue. Small brass plates were attached to the apron to provide the greatest possible protection for their body. And in the study, Brother Larry, I found that the belt was a very important piece of their armor. The girdle or belt was fastened around their waist and by the ends of their breastplate, so it held in place all the other parts of their armor. Every part of their armor was attached to this belt. It was a very essential part of the Roman soldier's attire, if you will. Without the girdle or belt, every other piece of armor would come apart, leaving the soldier open for attack. So the belt of truth was very important to them. Our loins are our waist, are a vital part of our bodies. We are to gird up our loins with truth. And the truth to us is the word of God. Yeah. The truth is the word of God. They said, I, hid, I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Yeah. It's, it's very important that we know the word of God. The, the truth is the word of God. John 8, 31 through 32. So if you continue in my words, when you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus prayed for his disciples. John 17, 14 through 18, he says, I have given them thy word, and the world that hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not 